I'm going to tell you about a guy who marked my childhood, a great figure in French history. This guy was made out of the same wood as Gandhi or Dr. King, but it was made in France. The guy I'm talking about was called Joseph Rezinski. Rezinski. That doesn't sound very French to me. Joseph was born in 1917 in Angers from a Spanish mother and a Polish father. Spanish and Polish. Well, better and better. He didn't go to school much, but if poverty had been a school, he would have graduated 10 times. One morning, his father left without notice, leaving his mother to take care of their five children. Then they were only four, as his sister died of hunger. Oh God, not cool. Not cool. So little Joseph took it upon himself to help support the family and went looking for work. He was five years old and his CV said, I can walk and color inside the lines. At the time, there weren't any jobs going in international finance, so he became an altar boy. A job paid two francs a week. That's really not much, but at least it prevented his family from starving. From altar boy, he graduated to priest. And one fine day, he was sent by his bishop to Noisy-le-Grand, on the outskirts of Paris, in an emergency housing township. Well, township is putting it mildly. It looked more like a World War II prison camp, or a shantytown made from half-wood barrels and overrun with rats. Ew, that's disgusting. Why are you telling us about all this? Well, that's the thing. This guy's story is about a movement that rose from the mud to fight the institution in France and beyond, which, as you can imagine, was quite a task. Little Joseph was already in his 40s when he moved to the camp in Noisy-le-Grand. And as he discovered these people's living condition, his whole childhood flashed before his eyes and he declared, these are my people and that sure ain't gonna happen. He started by kicking out charities and benevolent people who run soup kitchens for the camp. <laughs> Oh, what an idiot. Yeah, you can imagine the people of the camp weren't super happy about this. But Joe had some strong arguments. Hey, wait a minute. How are we supposed to survive without soup kitchens? Well, how did you manage before they came along? Well, we... We figured it out, I guess. There you go, then. Figure it out. Joseph was convinced that soup kitchens, although useful in situations of emergency, maintained the camp's residents in a state of dependence. Destitution cannot be alligated. It must be destroyed. Hand me downs that are too big. Too small. Too ugly. It helps in a pinch, but you can't live like that. Sure, it's better than going naked, but it doesn't really help in a job interview, does it? Joe didn't just kick out 28 charities from the camp. He replaced them with schooling for the children, with apprenticeships for the youth, basically with the tools to help people free themselves. And right in the middle of the camp, he set up a beauty parlor. A beauty parlor. You're kidding, right? Hello girls, Joseph here with a new beauty tutorial. So today, we're gonna learn how to take care of our hair. Okay, I might exaggerate. But his idea was to help the women of the camp reclaim their pride. Thanks to manicures and makeups, the ladies polished their self-esteem and styled their courage. And it worked. Everybody in the camp got together to erect collective buildings, a kindergarten, a library, and more and more people came to help out too. And every time someone volunteered, he suggested that they come and live in the camp. What? The rat camp? Why? To act together. In 1957, the families of the camp in Noisy took their destinies in hand and started a movement to fight against the institution, which they called Aid to Distress Fourth World. What the hell on earth is that supposed to be? The fourth world is that part of the population silenced by destitution, which has never appeared in history books. The people whom social progress has left behind over and over. And rather than enduring the situation with their heads bowed, the idea of the fourth world movement is for these people to unite and stand up for their rights. But obviously, finding a cool name, fourth world, you know what it is, wasn't enough to move things forward. The destitute families couldn't defend themselves because, because they were broke, we get it. Well, no. Because they weren't armed then. Revolution, wrong again. Because they didn't have the words. So Joseph set up people's universities to help them overcome the fear of misspeaking, to practice public speaking, and to assert themselves. Now that I think of it, democracy depends on every voice being heard, right? So the poor must be able to speak up and speak loud. Il faut que l'on soit respecté et on sera respecté si on sait parler. On sera reconnu comme des partenaires sociaux. Alors non seulement on défendra nos droits, mais on défendra les droits de tout le monde. Nous pourrons, eh bien, obliger le pays à changer. And the movement moved forward. Joseph traveled all over the world to unite the people of the fourth world. To the point where on October 17, 1987, a hundred thousands of them marched in Paris to proclaim that wherever men and women are condemned to live in extreme poverty, human rights are violated. To come together to ensure that these rights be respected 
is our solemn duty. Joseph Rosinski died the following year, but the wave he started continued to sweep the world. And I'm recording this video today because 2017 marked the 60th anniversary of this movement, an event of national importance according to the Ministry of Culture in France, but that none of my mates know about. Yet we should all desire the eradication of poverty. We have to imagine a society without poverty with those who experience it. So let's act together for dignity. What do you say? Hey yo, share this y'all. Sharing is caring! Oh what a ride, thank you for sharing!